Who's seen the, the videos of people that have been to hell? I went through the exact same thing. You can feel the heat, you can feel your skin burning, it bubbles up, it's horrific. I hated Christians. I hated Christians so much that I wanted to burn down every single church that I ever And why they would worship a pseudo god. Jesus was as real to me as the Easter Bunny. So, what was the point? That was not real. And um, I was pretty staunch. A um, few years ago, when we were catching up, that um, sometimes when he'd come to my house, um, you know, my mom and dad would always insist that he eat dinner with us or whatever, you know, when he came. Sometimes that was the only meal he had that day. I remember as a teenager, I, I slept with Bowman. It's like he was using drugs and alcohol and, you know, just whatever he wanted. Saying that he hit complete rock bottom. Because, um, let's say there were 100 people in the room. It was not Scott. <laughs> enough for people to go was Jesus's life tangible I go I'm going with you the anger that comes over has followed Christ at a great personal cost to receive Christ it just it was overwhelming um, uh, David ruined my life when he introduced me to Jesus. I had to give up women. I thought I had it going on. What people didn't realize was I'd already made out my suit. For the first time in my life. Christ, thank you so much for tuning in today. We're already here in person. Uh, also, if you're not on our website watching today, go ahead and go buy it. It's EncounterChrist.org, EncounterChrist.org if you want to be part of our church. Also, my wife normally has prayer requests, and we get them from all over the world. Go ahead and go to our website. It says prayer requests. Fill that out, and we'll put you on our prayer noon. So every day we, as a church, pray at 12 noon. When we first start. Communion. We're going to have communion after service today. No, you're not with us. Next time, next time, go ahead and get your crackers, your grape juice, whatever it is you use. I'm still Southern Baptist at heart, so we use grape juice. You like substances. Uh, we'll always use grape juice when it's me. Uh, so... Uh, for us today but uh, no next time we'll do it with you also envelopes we talked about this last week on the air envelopes did everybody bring their list for 2020 okay I'm gonna go over that in a sermon today uh, a lot of people forgot what they put on their list last year so here's an idea when you write out a list and you put it in a sealed envelope do one of two things make a copy or take a photo that way you know what you actually put on your list for for the year also, we have congratulations to our cameraman today. Terry got married over the weekend. Um, definitely, sh he got the better end of the bargain. Married way over his head. Uh, but the thing with Terry's wedding, we hate going to weddings. I mean, we're in our mid to late 50s, and normally weddings are a drag, and we don't want to go. And we do it to make our friends happy because we're either going to their kids or their grandkids' weddings. Yeah, we're at that age now. That's the most fun I've had at a wedding in a long time other than David's uh, daughter's wedding. So I, I, I'm two for two now on fun at weddings. Now the reason I have fun at David's daughter's wedding is I was sitting with all my old buddies from the old days. So I got to, got to talk to a lot of guys and I got to meet the mayor of Harrisburg. He rocks. So if you live in Harrisburg, North Carolina and you're watching, your mayor's fabulous, great guy. But Terry and Duke purposely put us with a group of kids and I say kids, they're in their mid twenties to thirties. Uh, they're still younger than some of our kids. Uh, they restored my faith in young people. Some of the sweetest, kindest people I think I've ever met. 
Uh, and then we got to meet everybody in the wedding party. And I thought Terry's mother-in-law was his wife's sister. Wow, this lady hadn't aged. I know she's got to be close to my age. She looks like she's 20. And Terry's wife looked fabulous, as she always does. And Terry's wife's beautiful. She's smart, and she can cook. And at the end of the wedding, she goes, I'm going to have you back over for dinner. So I was all good. And she fixes my favorite Korean dishes. Makes me very happy. So uh, Terry's friends, family, man, if you've got a next wedding to go to, get Terry to get remarried again, and you'll have a great time. Uh, so thank you so much, Terry, for inviting us. Again, that's Terry from 410 Media. Look him up. Uh, he's married now, so they've got to make more money. And if there's a baby on the way, Terry really needs money. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. So, all right, now we have Leanne. Come up here, girl. Now, if you're listening at home, I only have one microphone, so Leanne can't talk to you. So I'm going to talk for her. Okay. This is Leanne. Leanne's our newest sponsored missionary. Uh, she's been everywhere. Uh, she likes third world countries. I'm not going to build her testimony. I kidded her. I was going to make up this whole elaborate story about how she found Jesus. Mm. Unfortunately, she's a good kid who's always been a good kid. Now she's, what are you, like 19, right? I won't tell them your real well, age. I'm 30. Okay, she's not 30. And you can't hear her. So she's 19. Okay, she used to, no, I won't do it to you. Uh, she's going to where? Um, Guatemala. Guatemala. I asked her why not Haiti. If you're going third world, let's go all the way. Uh, but she's got a passion for what Christ has done for her. The great thing about this missionary, and I can't say this for every missionary that I've ever met. Now, we sponsor three. She's our third. Uh, you're leaving in how long? Six months? Um, I'm leaving at the end of this month. Okay, that's right. It's close. <laughs> My wife says I never pay attention. Uh, she's leaving at the end of this month. That would be January. Uh, I'm gonna put her stuff up on our website. All right, so our website's EncounterChrist.org if you wanna get involved with funding because we send people to the mission field and we act like they need to the fund themselves. Uh, no, we're part of this funding because this is Holy Ghost bound. She knows how to cast out devils, heal the sick, and preach the gospel. She's real. So if you wanna be part of our real ministry that's going overseas, to people that really need it, Leanne's the person uh, to go through. Give me your stuff. I'll make sure they have it and they can reach it. Thank you so Thank much. You. This is Leanne. Um, how did we meet? We walked into Dunkin' Donuts one day because we go into Dunkin' Donuts every Sunday and buy everybody donuts and the guys uh, breakfast. And it's funny because at this particular Dunkin' Donuts, I can't say this for all because a lot of times they're not very good staff people. Most of these folks are missionaries. So you have a missionary Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and they're all really nice, and we've gotten to know, got to know them, and uh, we knew there was something different about this Dunkin' Donuts, and we go in every Sunday. We just left a little while ago, but when we met her and we got to talk to her, it's nice to see someone who's 30 who gets it, okay? What's, what do we do all the time as, as, as baby boomers? We talk about millennials, and, and once, then we talk about Z, Y, and everybody else other than us, and we wonder why they don't get it. Well, she does, and she's gonna do fabulous things um, for Christ. Ari has. Uh, she already leads, she's led several teams uh, to minister for Christ and she's going to do that again. Now here's the key. Leanne's got to raise money because she's got to pay herself. Missionaries can't get paid if we don't help. And as a body of Christ and a body of believers, we've got to help them stay on the mission field. Unfortunately, as missionaries, most of them have to raise their own income. So whatever you can give, whatever it is, $5, $25, $100 a month, $500 a month, she's got to have enough to be able to go on this trip. Uh, we're going to contribute as a church for her, but we can't carry the whole tab. Uh, but uh, she's got still a pretty, pretty good room to go. So if you want to be part of Leanne's ministry, uh, we'll get her information, put it on the website, EncounterChrist.org, and uh, we'll be able to get that out. Fair? All right, good. All right, let's get to today's sermon. Before we get started, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being part of this coming year. Thank you for being part of our everyday life. Thank you for doing supernatural, because this is the year of supernatural things. Be with Leanne as she goes to Guatemala. She brings the word and joy of Christ and help her do the things that you've taken her there to do. And you've already answered every prayer at the cross, so we know where we're going with this. But protect her, be with her, be with the whole mission team, and keep them safe and get them on the right course for where you want them to be. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. All right. Now that we get into this, it's funny, I, uh, I got my, my sermon notes and, and I said, I got to get my notes so I'll know what I'm preaching. And David always reminds me, well, you don't follow them anyway, which is true. Uh, I normally don't follow my notes. And the kids, when I was a teacher, I was a teacher over 20 years. The kids are like, Mr. Farrell, do you ever use your notes? I write them out. 
But you always teach from memory. Yeah, I know the subject matter so well, I don't need them. Uh, people ask me, how do you know the Bible so well? Well, when you're dying and the only thing you can do is press a remote control for four years, uh, I think I've got about 11,000 hours of video time, of Bible time. Uh, having a reading issue, I have to actually look at the videos first to be able to read my Bible. Uh, so reading's not exactly the easiest thing I can do. But this is the first sermon of this year, 2020. So last year, 2019, about February, we filled out letters to ourselves. This is what I'm going to accomplish or what God's going to accomplish through me in 2019. And the premise was, it goes back to Scripture, let God be true and every man be a liar. And so I challenged my church to be, is God true or are you a liar? Well, most of us were liars, right? Okay. So most of us were. Well, what's the premise of that? Why did I do that? Because we forget as Christians we have supernatural power, and I'm going to go over this. And most of the things that we want to accomplish in this life, we can't do without the power of the Holy Spirit. So why don't we keep trying? Now, I had one on my list. This is the funny thing about my list. I was going to lose 50 pounds. So I was going to weigh 190. The only problem is I forgot to get on the scale before I did it. So I made my goal in a delusional world. As my doctor put it, you're morbidly obese, as he told me, like 25 times. And then I reminded him he only weighed 105, and I could put him in a garbage can if I wanted to. Then he stopped doing it. But uh, my buddy, Dr. Frank, who's a top physicist around the United States, uh, measures the oxygenation level of your mitochondria. So I'm, I was 94 years old, so I actually could barely breathe or walk upstairs, and I've gotten some of that use back. But we had to check to see where I was. And he goes, have you accurately weighed yourself? No. Come here. So he puts me on the scale, and I'm like, that's never to be told. Uh, instead of weighing 240 like I thought I did in my delusional world, it was more like 280. I've actually lost over 50 pounds this year. Now, I've still got 30 to go because my prize fighting weight's 200. Uh, but I'll get there. I was there before I got sick. So before I got sick, I actually weighed 195. Uh, but I haven't, I, I asked my wife the other day, when's the last time I really worked out? It was right before I almost died in the hospital, uh, seven years ago. So I haven't lifted or anything for about seven years. So this year will be my transition year uh, for getting back in shape. Why is that important? Well, at our age, if you don't lift and don't work out, you don't live long. When you hit your mid-50s, you have to do some type of resistance training. So did I allow my list? Technically, no. Was I delusional when I made it? Absolutely. We either, as humans, we either look in a mirror and see less of what we are or more. We normally don't get it right, so apparently I saw less. And then my wife was so sweet, she never told me I look like Fat Albert. She always tells me, oh, honey, you look so good. She's almost perfected lying as well as I have. She'll go, do I look fat in this? You couldn't look fat in anything. Right answer? This is normally when I tell the teenage boys, write that down. Do I look fat in these jeans? Impossibility. I think you look perfect in everything you wear. Okay, single ladies, remember that. If the guy didn't know how to answer the questions, get rid of him. All right, let me get back to today's lesson. All right, the teacher and me, if you're new, I taught for over 20 years. I'm used to having a marker on a board. I tried to get rid of this when we moved here as a real church. The members said no, so I have to keep the board. I think it's really because the little girls like to write on it at the end of the service. I think it has nothing to do with me. So as we enter a new year, one of the most disturbing things I saw on social media this week were memes. And one meme that really bothers me is, it's a new year, same me. And they wore that moniker with pride. That means, I'm good, you're the problem. Don't we have enough of I'm good, you're the problem in society? Okay, so one of the problems is we don't know who we are in Christ. We don't know who the Holy Spirit is. We don't understand where our citizenship is and what it is, what it, our role is. And we've got a missionary here. What's her three things she's got to do when she goes to Guatemala? Heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. Very clear on her objectives. So she's got three things to do. Now, there's more to that, but what are our three things? It's no different than right now the playoffs are going on and we've got the national championship coming on and Gainesville's finest had a great night last night. Deshaun had a great night and, yeah. and took. It's funny because if you're watching on, the place Deshaun played high school football is across the street. The very field he, he played and was an All-American is right across the street. We can look over and see the field that Deshaun played on. And Miss Gainesville High School, my wife, was a cheerleader on that very field also. 
No, it means nothing. She hates it when I tell people that. But uh, I like to throw that in. But right now it's playoff time. They have one objective. What is it? Every time you suit up, it's to win. What's my job as a pastor? I have to teach you how to win. What's winning look like? What's victory look like as a Christian? Well, when she goes to Guatemala, it's going to be very easy. There's demon possessed people. All right, she's going to lay hands on them. She's going to announce the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's going to take over. They're no longer going to be demon possessed. All right, check. Got that one right. All right, somebody's going to be lame or sick. Lay hands on them. They're, they're well. All right, check. Now she's got to preach the gospel. What's that really mean? We've gotten that one wrong. For, for this generation, and I was asking the kids, anybody under 30 is a kid to me. Um, we were asking them, for their generation, what's the thing that they talk about as far as Christ, etc., or what's the most difficult thing they have as people talking to people about Christ? All right, see, when, when, when I was a kid, back in Galilee, you know, I was born in the 60s, there was one thing we talked about. You were going to hell or you weren't. Okay, it was very simple when, when I was a kid. Hell or no hell? Now it's more of how we feel than a destination. Is that really true? Is that really the gospel? What is the gospel? And I ask, because I used to be on the radio, I would ask people all the time, what is this to you? Because I was, I was the male Delilah if you listen to my show. It was funny, Delilah and I have the same agent. Steve Wall, love you brother if you're watching. Um, Steve's great. Um, he was, he was uh, if you ever saw WKRP, uh, Steve was one of those guys. He was more, I always like to say he was not Johnny Fever, but he was Randy Travis. I was Johnny Fever when I was on the radio. Um, so dressed the same, played the same music, etc. But we've muddied the water on what we're supposed to do, especially as Christians. And that comes from, if you don't know what the objective is, if you don't know what you're supposed to do as a Christian, it's because you don't have your identity set, right? So many people don't know why they received Christ, what that really means, what that entitled you to, and what you're supposed to do every single day. So I'm gonna help clarify that today because today's the first Sunday of the new year. And if you get it wrong today, are you gonna get it wrong every other day? Yeah, because what do we do as, as the year turns, we see the peach drop if you're in Atlanta, you see the ball drop in New York City, and we all celebrate Happy New Year. What's that really mean? Does that mean anything to most people? I just got drunk, I can barely get up the next day, uh, there's nothing new about me. I've established nothing, but I'm going to write down on paper 10 resolutions I'm going to do this year with no backing and I have really no reason to do them. Same reason I've got several friends that are personal trainers or, or big time uh, you know, trainers for athletic teams. Everybody is in the gym in January. Places packed you can't get in. It's kind of like churches. Churches are packed out in April, June, December. And a lot of times they get really busy late in August because you got to pray for the kids because they went back to school and you've already learned that you're already angry about everything. So we have three months, three to four months that we have people attend church. But gyms are packed, they get a little less in February and they're empty by March. Why? Didn't you really want to lose weight? Didn't you want to get in shape? Didn't you want to start drinking? Didn't you want to stop doing drugs? Didn't you want to stay married? Didn't you want to spend more time with your kids? What was it? What was your resolution? And why'd you make it? Okay, what do I do for a living? I'm America's behavior expert, right? I do radio, TV, and I coach personal clients. Now I do business consulting, but also do personal. So what do I do really? I solve problems. You tell me your problem and I'll tell you how to fix it. You tell Jesus your problem, he'll show you how to fix it, right? All right, so let's go over this. How many days do we have in one calendar year? It's okay, we're charismatic, yell it out, yell it out. 365 except for a leap year, which is, yeah, there we go. So. What happens if we have one less year? That's a trick question, it means nothing. All right, so this is January, all right? How many days do we have in January? Let's say 30, I know there's, there's more than that. So February has, let's say 30, it makes the math easy, March, etc. If I do 30, 30 days, if I do that for 10 months, that's how many days? 300. It's simple math, guys. It's not engineering class. It's just not, you know, calculus. If I do it times 12, how many days is that? Okay, so let's make this easy. Let's say we only have 360 days. Okay, that's easy math, right? All right, so let's break this down from a behavioral standpoint, though, because I only count things that I can visually see or observation. So as a behavioralist, we only go things we can observe. If we can't observe it, it didn't happen. All right, so let's say in January, now, Let's say, hmm, 
How many thoughts does the average human have on a daily basis? I'm married to a blonde, so it varies. But uh, how many? Don't worry, after this camera goes off, she's abusive. It's like living with Ike Turner, I'm telling you. What? 70,000. Okay, average human has 20,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. For easy math, we're gonna use 30. So how many thoughts do they have for the month? 900,000, great, thank you for shouting that out. Okay, good. So if we do this for 12 months, we've got over a million, right? Pretty close. Okay, so let's say a million thoughts for the whole year. One million thoughts, one million. Okay. What was the directive from God for us? Guard our what? Minds. Who's on the other team that we're not part of any longer? Yeah, oh yes, his name's Lucifer. Okay, Lucifer's the God of what? This world, we're not. Adam committed treason, Jesus had to come out and get our rights, okay? So the second Adam, we're the third Adam, so we actually could, but what we don't realize is, what's the most powerful thing that Lucifer has as a weapon against us for this coming year? Thoughts. Our thoughts, okay? All right, what's his job? Steal, kill, destroy. John 10:10. 10, 10. it's very simple. He's very clear on his objective for the rest of our lives. Now, does he care if you come to church? No, no, he doesn't at all. Come to church, he's here. Somebody's here right now, we just can't see him. So his forces are here and so are ours. But the one thing that Christ told us over and over and over and over again was to guard our heart, which our spirit, which leads to our mind. Do we? Well, let's look at this. Lucifer has 900,000 opportunities to destroy you. 900,000. Remember when Jesus talks about idle thoughts. Idle thoughts lead to idle words. Words are used for creation, not communication. That's why 93% of all human communication is nonverbal. Do you know when your wife is angry without her speaking? Absolutely. Do you know when mom is angry when you're a child without her speaking? Do the pets know when everybody's angry in the house? Therefore, you do not use words. But therefore, creation. So if Lucifer can control 900,000 opportunities, he can get you to say exactly what he wants you to say. Okay? She's getting ready to go to a third world country. Do you think it's very important to realize that it's not communication, but it's creation? Because she's going to encounter every demon from hell while she's there. They have one objective, to destroy her. And destroy the witness and destroy the people there. That's why Haiti and Guatemala are two of the most demon-infested places on the earth. And the fact that she's even going there means that she's equipped to go. Now, I've talked to missionaries that weren't. They came back quickly. She actually has a passion to live there, and the only reason you want to live in Guatemala is because God told you to. Yeah, they have sun and they have ocean, but there's other places to do that. Me, I think I should be a missionary to Nice. Monaco, well, I think I could do that. All right, so if we've got a million thoughts per year, how important is it to stay on offense and not defense? I was a coach. Can you score on defense? Do de does defense really win championships like my father would have said? No. It doesn't. It's great if you can stop people, but until you get the ball, you can't win. Okay, what is our ball as Christians? It's right there. The Word was God, the Word is God, the Word is what controls us and what we do. Okay, for 2020, this is your ball. This is how you score. How many people do I have to listen to every single day that don't know how to score? They don't have any hope. They don't want to live any longer. I work with a lot of atheists. They don't even understand that God's real. And I work with people from all over the world, so it's very interesting to get their perspective on what this is. But we in, in America, the only free country left, don't really respect this anymore. We're talking to, to Duke earlier today. My generation believed at a 33% rate. My parents' generation believed at 66%, and my great-grandparents was about 82. Okay, current generation that's back there with my wife currently is four. What's currently going on in Australia? The entire country's on fire. I have family in Australia. Um, the whole country's on fire. Guess what their belief level is? 1%. Okay, we're one cycle, we're one 10 year cycle away from the United States being 1%. Now the great thing was, if you looked at some of the news this week, not, not traditional news, about 65,000 kids went to a dome this past New Year's Eve and welcomed in the New Year for Jesus. 
Praise God. Now, we were part of, we were born when one of the huge revivals came and when Billy Graham really hit stratosphere as far as popularity. Who's our next Billy Graham? Because we haven't seen him yet. You want to know why? What affects those 900,000 thoughts? What's the biggest thing? What's the biggest problem with today's generation? They have no what? Okay, remember if you're watching, I have dyslexia. If the word's spelled wrong, just spell it right at home. Identity. You don't know who you are. What happens when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior? We get a new identity. Okay? And normally if you're Southern Baptist, you get a Bible and you get some punch and crackers and you meet the pastor. Okay, down in the, down in the fellowship hall. If you're charismatic, uh, we take you somewhere nicer. <laughs> okay, because we don't have a fellowship hall because we're at the Civic Center. But I really like the punch and I love those cookies. We don't know who we are. Okay, so the average person is going to make out today is the first Sunday in, in, in January. is going to make out resolutions connected to what? That's the problem. To what? The number one problem I encounter with everybody that I coach is they don't know who they are, where they're going, and where they came from. They don't have a purpose, plan, direction for their lives. That's number one I have to work on with every single person, regardless of whether it's a business client or a personal client. I have to start with purpose. Well, purpose is always linked to what? Where did we start out? Where, did we, where were we formed? Heaven. Jesus whispered into our ear who we were going to be. Before we got here, we knew who we were. We were born, so we're programmed to fail, and we're born for success. We have the ultimate power once we become and understand our identity as a citizen of heaven. So that's where it comes. Can you know who you are before you receive Christ? You know what your skill set is, but you don't know what you're going to do with it. We have a missionary here. She's 30 years old. She knows exactly what her skill set is going to be used for the rest of her life. Kind of like me as a pastor. The two of us do not get to retire. Okay? For the rest of our lives, we're going to do some form of mission field. Mine just happens to be here, which I really like. Uh, I'll send cards, about as close as I'm getting to Guatemala. But I'll send you a card from time to time, and we'll send you a check. You probably like the check more than a card. But... Uh, I know where I'm supposed to be. And I, I, when we first met, and you may have heard this, and it'll be in the documentary, when I first met her, she was doing a paper on bipolar disorder, and I was the expert at it. So she wanted to interview me. But the next date, we went and met all my friends. My, uh, my mentor is one of the heads of Samaritan's Purse. So she got to meet him and the head of Fellowship for Christian Athletes and a few other people in the room that were my buddies. And then we talked again, and I said, well, I never want to be a pastor, and I will never live in Gainesville, Georgia, ever. I'll never be a pastor, so I'll make you these promises. She looked at me, she goes, I don't ever want to be a pastor's wife, and I will never live in my hometown of Gainesville, Georgia. We're both liars. Why? Because it was not connected to the identity that Jesus wanted me to have. See how we can get a little off? I did not realize that God would call me to no longer coach basketball and coach people. Me, I could have lived on the basketball court and never left. And my star was rising, and, and I was very successful at what I did. And then God told me one day, you're never going to coach again. You're done. Resign. It took him 14 years to tell me why I quit that job. He had to do what? Work on my identity. Okay, my identity previously was a coach, a coach with a basketball, with 13 kids in a locker room, and that was it. He had to actually school me, even though I was a great religion student. In college, they actually tried to get me to major in religion and not in education, uh, because I was their top student in religion. Big deal, I actually understood the Bible. Just because you understand something doesn't mean you implement it. A lot of people understand things backward and forward and can't do anything with them. So he had to work on my identity. It took him 14 years to talk me into doing the job. I did not go into this job wanting to do it. I did not want to be a pastor. I'm not a people person, not real good with people. I'm great one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm terrible in the crowd. The reason I did radio and TV is because there's a camera and a microphone and I ain't got to talk to anybody else except my producer. So I get along great with Terry and Duke and that's great. They're with me all the time. But you have to know what your identity is. But your identity is connected to your citizenship, right? I am a citizen of heaven now, not earth. What's that really mean? So if we're going to talk about the gospel, and we're going to talk about 2020, and we're going to talk about a new life, we have to understand who we are, where we belong, what our skill set is, and what our powers are. We don't get powers from Lucifer. Who's the God of this world? 
Okay, you're on one team or the other. You want your powers from Lucifer or from Jesus? Are you sure? Because most of the stuff on your list didn't come true. So answer that question again truthfully. You say, I used to ask my kids when we go in the locker room, we'd be down by 20. I thought you said you were ready to play. Are you a liar? Did you lie to me in practice this week? I remember one time we were in uh, Junior Olympics, I think, Junior Olympics State Games, something. We had not gotten across half court for the entire half. Not even gotten the ball across half court. So I called the timeout, and my assistant's like, oh, boy, he's going to go off on him. Instead, I looked at him, and I said, uh, we got him right where we want him. We're down by 25. They're overconfident. God knows we can't get any worse. Y'all haven't gotten the ball across half court. So here's how we're going to win. We won by 25. Over our coach, I didn't really like anyway, so it was joyous. Uh, so they understood where we were, what we're going to do, and how we're going to get there. Most people make out resolutions based on what? Who they are now and what they can accomplish personally. And then at the end of the year, do even, they even accomplish the things they said they could accomplish? Well, no. But when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and we receive the power of baptism and the Holy Spirit, you change citizenship. Okay. When you change citizenship, now where does your driver's license say you live? You're no longer part of this world. Be in the world, not of. Now, my citizenship card actually belongs in heaven. I no longer have to live by the rules of this world. L Satan wants us to live in time and space, right? Okay, space time theorem. We were created outside of time and space. Okay, so if you don't know what that is, if you're at home, look up space time theorem. It'll explain it. God created us outside of time and space, which means when we become citizens of heaven and no longer of earth, that we have the exact same power he had. Remember, first Adam was who? Adam. Second Adam was Jesus. Who's the third Adam? Us. When Jesus got the keys to heaven and hell, Revelation 118, it means that he got all of our powers back that Adam originally had. If you're at home, if you ever want to know what the powers were, read Genesis 1, specifically 26 through 32. Now, if you want to learn how he got rid of them all, read the rest of 2 and 3. But if you want to know what your real powers are, go to Genesis 12 and read all the way to the end. Okay, because everything that Abraham was promised in Genesis 12, we're promised. Now I want you to open your Bibles from Roman 12. Roman 12. For millennials, that means dial your phone to whatever Bible app you have. Did I get that right? If you're new to me, I give millennials a really hard time. But who created millennials? Baby boomers. All right, so go to Romans 12. I want to show you why this is so important. If we don't realize anything else during this sermon today, I want you to realize where your citizenship is. All right, everybody ready? All right, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Is he kidding about this? Now, he's getting ready to tell you why this is so important. And be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, here's the key. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What's this really mean? Any NASCAR fans in here? All right. I'm part of a famous family, won't mention it now, but the best driver ever in history of NASCAR. Um, he ruled. Um, NASCAR. I grew up, all my buddies worked for NASCAR teams. I'm the only guy that can't fix anything. I used to make fun of them. They were always making them cars. Then I turned on TV, and all my buddies are on TV every Sunday. Most have retired now. But NASCAR's different from Formula One. Does anybody know what the difference is? Great. No race fans here. Maybe there's somebody online. Formula One, it's not based on a driver's talent. It's based on the car. Now, you've got to have talent, but Formula One, you can actually work with the engine. In NASCAR, every engine is set to where it's personally up to the driver to perform. So you've got 43 cars out there. All the engines are set to where it's competitive. Now, if you win, it's based on your skill, not the car. Thanks, Richard Petty. You're the reason they do that. Richard's car was so much better, they had to do that. But now, doesn't that sound like Christianity? What did he just say? We're all given what? Same, same measure of faith. All right, what's that really mean? Same. Sounds kind of like what we're guaranteed as citizens, right? 
Life, love, you know, a pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We're saying, all right, so I received Jesus. In 2020, I received Jesus. I have the exact same measure of faith of every single person in my church. Now we're like a NASCAR race. We've got 43 people, and whoever gets to that finish line first, it's based on the outcome that they predetermined they're willing to go through and get there. So God's given you. So whose amount of faith do you have? Somebody named Jesus. So now you've been given the exact same measure of faith that Jesus had. Did Jesus come into this world and accomplish everything he set out to? Did anything defeat him? No, he even beat death. He beat all of heaven and hell. He was so good at what he did, Lucifer, who was created by Jesus, did not even know who he was. He checked, tempted him three times and had to keep asking him questions because he didn't know who was standing in front of him. Because he was able to be human so well that even we didn't know who he was. So if Jesus has given you the same measure of faith he had, therefore he's granted you the exact same power he had. Is there any reason why you, you can't accomplish what he did? No. Now, outside of walking on water, I think Leanne's going to do everything Jesus did. If you walk on water, take a photo, send it to us. Okay. Don't do the plexiglass thing like uh, MTV videos. You've got to walk on it for real. So when you're making out your 2020 resolutions, or in our case as a church, the list that I'm going to accomplish this year, there's things you've got to factor into this. A lot of times when we make out a resolution, it's something that our husband or wife's told us we had to do, our boss told us we had to do, our kids suggested we do, or something that's been nagging us but we really don't care. But now, if you look at 2020 and you go, my identity, my ascendancy's in heaven. I have the exact same measure of faith that Jesus had, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do every single thing that he said I could. Now turn to Mark 16, 15. This is the scripture that our church is based on. Originally, I have like, uh, I have a hundred scripture, I think, written down. I'm not going to go through all hundred. Our, our pastor, Alan DeDio in Charlotte, likes to do Bible aerobics. In one Wednesday night service in one hour, he did 85 scripture. And they looked up all 85. <laughs> all right, so Mark 16, 15. This is what our church is based on. Is everybody there? He's still flipping. Okay. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Was he pretty clear on what we could do? Yes, actually, Lester Summerall tells stories about people drinking poison and living. Uh, Paul did that. He got bitten by a serpent, pulled him off, went back to what he was doing. So, very clear. Preach the gospel, cast out devils, heal the sick. Okay, so let's look at my list for this past year. I'm dying. So this year, in 2019, my, my thing was live, be completely healed. Outside of my hands not working in my, my glasses, my blood test came back and I'm completely healed. As a matter of fact, I can't get that illness ever again. I have the blood of a newborn. I also have a brand new heart, liver, kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. Everything's been replaced. And it was placed when I went to sleep one night, it was damaged. I woke up the very next day and it was all replaced. I got brand new parts. Why? Because I understand that my citizenship's in heaven. I don't operate outside of time. I don't operate within time and space. Therefore, I can request a new liver, new kidneys, new heart, new lungs, and God can supply them to me. Because how do we pay for things in our kingdom? Money or faith? So faith is our currency because we live where? Does God need your money? Do you tithe to make God happy and because he needs your money or because that's how he gets things through you? Yeah, obedience. God doesn't need our money. He needs our faith. Did Jesus do anything outside of faith? No. He actually had to have the power of the Holy Spirit. He came when his cousin dunked him. Uh, so we had the power of the Holy Spirit. He was able to do anything that he said. Therefore, you have the ability to do anything you say. Does everything you say come true? Absolutely. You are the sum total of your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and words to this day. Every single thing that you profess into the world has become true. Hmm. But you're professing things that who assigns to you? So if you're broke, if you're sick, if you don't have the job you want, if you've got bad friends, if you don't like your family, etc., etc., whose fault's that? 
Because God gave you what? We all started at the same spot with the same equipment. If that is true, since God's no respective person, every single person has the same advantage. And now that we're all citizens of heaven and we understand where our identity comes from, who's our supplier? It's no longer the earth. So therefore, if I believe, ask, believe, receive, as he tells us to do. So every single thing that I speak through faith has to come true. So every single day I got up and said, my blood is 100% healed. My heart is brand new. My lungs work at 100%. I said, my liver is brand new. And I went through the whole thing every single day, all day long. And then I went and got my reference scripture. I went and got the ball and dribbled it down the court. Because everything that he says, he has to back. And if I stay what he says, it has to come true. Okay, it's just like Aladdin. You get three rubs. But in our lives, we get endless amounts of rubs. Because Disney's not making us do it in 90 minutes. Okay? Okay? It's a lifetime. So I'm completely healed because that's what I stated. Do you know how many friends I lost this year who didn't state what I did? A guy collapsed and died. A good friend of mine died from a heart attack the very same day I collapsed. We both had the same problem. Jesus was able to heal me. He died. Also, it helps to have a wife who tells you every single day, don't you die on me. You're not allowed to die. You have to stay. And then she got Norval Hayes's, I'll live and not die. And then she handed it to me every day. Norval's talking to you. Norval's talking to you. But did I have the legal jurisdiction and right to ask for my healing? Absolutely. Because where's my citizenship again? So when I'm making out my proclamations for 2020, am I writing them for earth or writing them for heaven? Does that give you more perspective on what you should write down? Because... If you have all the rights and privileges of heaven, how should you write those things down? Is there anything that can stop you other than you? you got to remember, Lucifer can only do what you ask him to do. He only has jurisdiction here. Power of life and death is in the... Go back and read Proverbs if you have any questions about that. Proverbs 18.21 says it all. Jesus spent four Gospels and the rest of the New Testament trying to tell us what was possible. Then if you want to really look at what Jesus said, go back to Deuteronomy, go back to Leviticus, go back to Genesis, and go back to Isaiah. That was Jesus too. Remember, ego me, I am. I am was there at the start. He's going to be there at the finish. He's given you the ability to grant every request you've ever had. Why aren't you making requests of that based on your new citizenship? Why aren't you controlling the 900,000 thought, 900, thoughts you have per month? What do we talk about every day? If you keep the ball in your hand, can Satan take it away from you? Can he? How does Satan take the ball away from a Christian? Words. Whatever you speak gives him permission to take the ball away from you. Now, if he takes the ball away from you, do you have the permission to go get it? Boy, I wish that existed in basketball. It doesn't. Or football. Give me the ball. It's, that's my ball. I'm going home. Anybody ever play with that kid? If he didn't get the play the way he thought he should, he'd get his ball and go home. And unfortunately, it was always the kid that had the only ball. So we started buying extra baseball so we didn't have to do that anymore. So Satan takes the ball from with you. All you have to do is pray, claim the name of Jesus, and you take the ball back. And now you're back on offense. So why do Christians spend so much time on defense? Well, that's our fault, pastors. It's our fault you don't know any better, right? Because if you look at Romans 10, 10, 9, and on, it takes a pastor to teach we have a missionary now that's going to Guatemala to teach. How are the people going to learn if she doesn't teach them? So anybody goes to hell in Guatemala, it's all her fault, right? Oh, okay, I got the mission wrong. I'm sorry. There's going to be two of them. So it's both of their fault. No. It's our job to proclaim the gospel. It's their job to receive it. But in a church setting, we take for granted you guys are already on the team, right? So if you guys are on the team, it's my job as coach to teach you the place, teach you your rights, teach you why you're on the team, and teach you what we can win. Well, I've just told you that you're a citizen of heaven, you have the exact same power that Jesus had, and now it's up to you to control the 900,000 thoughts you have per month. Did you know you had 900,000 thoughts before today? I teach this at business conferences. You should see their face. Because they have sales seminars, they have, uh, you know, ropes courses. I'm not real big on team building exercises but they never thought about what they thought about all day. When we enter our office building, is it different when we enter church? 
Actually, we normally enter the office building happier than we do when we get to church. Why? National average says that's true. Why? Who did we leave behind when we go to work? The kids, the arguments. We went to our favorite coffee place on the way to work and we go in the office and for the most part, a lot of times we work with people we like. And it's a respite from our lives, right? For, for at least eight hours. As a teacher, I never had time to think about myself. I was already in the classroom, I'm thinking about everybody else. So it gave me a respite from my real life. All right, now church. What's Lucifer's number one job when a married couple gets ready to go to church? Make them argue. What's the number one job of kids to do before they go to church? Fight. Don't put their clothes on. If it's little boys, they take them back off. All right, I just got you in coat and tie. Why are you naked again? Okay, parents go through this. Then on the way to church, for some reason, one of us will say something we knew not to say. <laughs> it's just like with men. We know better. We know we're not supposed to say it, but I had no idea how it got out of my mouth. Oh, my gosh. I know she's going to go off, but I said it anyway. It's that one day a week, right? It's your job. It's Lucifer's job. Okay, so you controlled 899,999 of those, but you didn't control one. And what happens when you didn't control the one? You fight all the way to church, and then magically when we get to church, we get in the parking lot, we see other Christians who are just like us. We get out of the car and go, oh my God, praise Jesus, brother. It's so good to see. It's been a glorious, isn't God good? Now, we still haven't addressed our fouls that we've been yelling profanity at and the kids. And then we go into church like nothing happened. We're Susie and Johnny, wonderful Christian. We got our hands up. We're praising God. We've gone through the worship service. We love Jesus. And as soon as we get back in the car, Jesus died. And we're right back to where we started. Right? Anybody that's been married knows this. And then you're right back in each other's faces, if you're still speaking. <laughs> then you go home in silence, and then you spend the rest of the day in silence. Am I the only guy that's done this? No. Okay, you're not married if you hadn't fallen on the way to church. Yep. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Je Jesus said you don't have to, but Lucifer said you didn't. Lucifer only wants to control one thought. But if he can have one, he can destroy you. Are you really going to let him do that? He's a punk. Jesus won the battle. He says, all you got to do is stomp on him. All you have to do is proclaim my name and he must flee. He gave you the offense. All you got to do is use it. Why aren't we using that? Every year I talk to Christians to say, I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to study harder. I'm going to believe Jesus. I'm going to accomplish more. Really? You know how many have come back to me and told me they were actually successful? Zero. Why? They're still operating from an earth mentality, not a heaven mentality. Look at us. I didn't work for five years and we lost everything. So what, this past week I had to take her car back. So the, the service girl's wonderful. Her husband currently has a brain tumor and our church has been praying for him. So she starts giggling and I'm like, what's so funny? She goes, I got your courtesy car outside. Come on, come with me. I go out and it's the very convertible my wife wants. She's got it on a board at home. Melissa knows this. So I go out, and even the guys in the bay are laughing. I'm like, you're kidding me. She goes, oh, no. It's going to be beautiful this, this weekend. I want you guys to put the top down, drive around. Even come back a little later. Bring the car back later so you guys can under, under, enjoy the two days of sunshine. You're kidding me. Oh, no. Take it. You know, what we talk about here, because we do quantum physics here, is we talk about popping a quiff. Okay, popping a quiff is actually when God will give you a highlight of your future within a nanosecond of the next thought. So if, if you've got, the average human has 30,000 thoughts a day, do the math on the 24 hours. And you really have to deduct because in sleep we go into a different thought process. But a quiff is something God will show us a preview of the future within a thought. And if you'll hold on to that and write it down, it's what heaven is showing you a preview of the future. Okay, so a quiff really is something that's real. Now, a quantum, actually, a theoretical physicist would be able to explain that to you. Uh, but it, I won't get in on a quantum of that. But it is true. If you can grab that thought, you can materialize it. Because God's just given you the ability to see heaven and to see what the possible outcome is if you grab it and have faith for it. So now she's been driving the car. It was, what, 35 degrees yesterday. She's driving around with the top down. How did I know it was her? She pulls in, and all I can hear is the music. It's so loud, everybody around could hear the music. But will she have that car? I told Melissa, I was like, you just cost me a lot of money. 
because now we have to buy it. She goes, that's the whole idea. I'm at a car dealership. Why would I put you in something you don't want? It's great. They give you the car they know you want next. They gave me an SUV one time and they're like, <laughs> he's just gritted. He goes, when are you coming back to get this one? But how we got our cars within the scope of, of the Holy Spirit. Our credit was ruined. We had nothing. We go get a Mercedes. Long story on why. You'll see it in the interview. Nobody wanted to give us a car, but the Mercedes dealership gave it to us for what we wanted, the price we wanted, and it was the very car I wanted previously. So now they take care of us. As a matter of fact, she calls and she goes, you want bad news or good news first? Okay, the bad news is you have a fuel hose that's bad. It's about $3,000. The good news is we handled it. No fee to y'all. Where do I live? I have something called favor, right? Because I'm a citizen of heaven. Heaven and earth have to move when I speak, right? So I spoke on the way over that everything on our car is going to be fixed, and if it's not, it's going to be handled by warranty. We were 900 miles outside the warranty. Great. Uh, but they were like, your grandfather did, and we're going to handle it. Stuff happens like that to us all the time. People go, you know, this discount doesn't count because it's you, I'm going to do it. I go to Kroger, people open a Kroger line just for me and close it. That never happens at Walmart. I think Lucifer's control of Walmart. There's 17 aisles, one cashier, and then everybody has to go through shelf check. I've never gotten favor at Walmart. I, th I think it's the place of the damned. That's why I don't go. Huh? Uh, I, don't go to, I don't like to go to retail stuff. It's called Amazon. Lovely thing. Lovely concept. All right, so let's go over this. If we're going to be cool for 2020, where's my citizenship? Heaven. What are my legal rights and privileges of a citizen of heaven? Anything that I believe and ask for through faith, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's anything that I desire. God wants us to give us the desires of our heart. Now, let's look at heart. Is that the blood pump? What is our heart? It's our spirit. Okay. When he made us in his image, what image was that? It was mine because I'm the best looking thing on earth. Right? Everybody should look like me. Actually, no, everybody needs to look like Hugh Jackman, Brad Pitt, uh, who else? Uh, my buddy Frank. Frank, if you're listening, my buddy Frank's one of the prettiest people I've ever seen. So is his wife. Uh, Patricia always goes, Frank, aren't you hot? Take your shirt off. <laughs> Never fails. And the other day he put one of his shirtless photos on Facebook. It wasn't a look good. He was trying to make a point about lifestyle. Uh, Frank overcame Tourette's through natural means. And now he's a personal trainer in Hollywood to the stars. And he'll take his shirt off to prove that I'm 44 years old and I still have 3% body fat. Here's why. Don't, don't worry, I will never put a shirtless photo on Facebook. I promise. <laughs> I would never do that to anybody. I'm the type of stripper that starts out nude and you, they pay me to put my clothes back on. Okay, so don't ever worry. All right, so heart. What is our heart? So we're spirit, soul, and body, right? Okay, and God made us what? Soul, that's wine, will, and emotion, and body. Okay, so we're a spiritual being. What type of body did Adam and Eve have? Was it sort of like ours, or was it sort of? It was sort of. It was a heavenly body because they could do heavenly things. Because Adam committed high treason, signed up with Lucifer, and gave Lucifer and made him the king of this world, Jesus had to come back down on the cross, shed his blood, to have the grace for us to do this. But are you telling Jesus every single day he was a waste of his payment? He bought you the membership. Why aren't you going? So Jesus' blood, through grace, paid for your rights and privileges to live as heaven on earth. And every day you don't, you tell him no thanks. You, your, your fee paid was useless. That's all right, Jesus. I know you went to the cross for me and shed your blood, but I'm all good. I don't want all the rights and privileges of heaven. Okay, I've been a member of a country club. I used to play golf every single day. Why? I had to just follow the money I just spent on the membership. To tell you how stupid I am, my son and I, well, this was when he was still in high school, we played, it was 25 degrees on Christmas Eve. And we decided we were going to play. And it's raining. So we get there and the golf pro goes, if you're dumb enough to play, enjoy. We made it through two holes. Finally he goes, all right, I'm tough, but I don't want to be this tough. This ain't military training. I'm ready to go back. <laughs> so we stopped. But I spent so much on the membership, I was going to get my money's worth, right? And then they have an eating plan. You got to pay for that. Then you got your monthly dues. Okay, so I was very aware of how much I spent for that membership. And I played golf every day. People are not keenly aware of what Jesus paid for. 
because we treat heaven like it's, eh, you know, I go to church, I don't go to church. What are the three times people go to church? Mother's Day, Easter, and Christmas. Why? Why bother? And we don't even get the Christmas story right, and we don't get Easter right either. All right, so we missed out on two, and then we get Mother's Day. Okay? If you grew up like I did, Mother's Day is no big deal either. All right, so there's three days that don't count. We have 52 opportunities every single year to go worship Jesus at his house, or four walls. It's really here. So why is it not a big deal for us to worship our Lord and Savior? But we say we believe. Because we don't understand that we're spirit first, soul, then body. Body's last. But how do we live on earth? In the body. We treat everything like it's body, not soul, not spirit. Spirits or souls, mind, will, and emotions. Oh, it goes back to your thoughts again, right? So your spirit first. Why don't we speak in tongues? It's our walkie-talkie system to heaven. Lucifer can't listen, and all we can do is negotiate with God. He downloads, and we go do it. All right, but where do we then live most of our life over here? This generation now is about how they feel. I saw a turn. I started. I taught almost four, four generations. I was able to teach so many different areas, but the one thing that really hit me the last 10 years I taught was it was more about feelings and not about facts. Okay, the youngest generation now, it's how they feel, not what the fact is. Okay, so if that's true, now we've shifted completely over and this doesn't matter anymore. But again, whose fault is it that people don't know? It's pastors. We haven't taught you. So now that you know that you're a spiritual being whose residence belongs in heaven and everything you ask for can come true, how are you going to make out your resolutions for 2020? Are they going to be based on the citizenship in heaven or the citizenship in the United States, so to speak, or on earth? Which one's it going to be? How many people, she's going to Guatemala. How many people would gladly leave Guatemala tomorrow? bunch. We've got friends from both places and a friend of mine uh, adopted kids from Guatemala. They're hell on earth. Try Haiti. If you want hell on earth, visit sometimes. Uh, a friend of mine did three tours in Iraq. He'll talk about hell on earth. I got up today in a free country. I got up today with all the rights and privileges that God gave me. I understand what I've been given, but how many people take this for granted on a daily basis? How many people in church right now unhappy with what they have? Okay, again, where did Jesus start us? We all started the marathon at the same spot. And there aren't any people that are elite in this status. Why? Because everybody has the same power. Everybody has Jesus' power. The reason Jesus lived three years and didn't die as soon as he got here was he was showing us how to do it. And it's something that I am came in human form for as long as he did, showed us exactly what to do, and then went and started to wait for us and then could coach us and then sent us all of his power to do it exactly the way he did, and we say, no thanks. I'm good. How many times have you done that? I'm good. I don't need it. You know how I many pe people will ask me for help and then not do anything I tell them? The reason I charge as much as I do, I want it to hurt. So when I charge you and you get my bill, and a lot of times it's enormous, it hurts you so much you cannot even think about not doing what I told you to do. But people still pay me. I had a guy come to me one time, loved the guy, he was funny. He's addicted to porn, I told him what to do. So he called me and he was at a hotel with a hooker. And he goes, you know man, I really like you. He goes, I prepaid you so keep it, but I'm gonna fire myself from the program because I'm not ready to give it up. I started to laugh, I said, cool, I'll, I'll cash the check or whatever. He knew who he was. He knew what he wasn't going to give up, and he knew what he wanted. But so many of us live in between. Okay, What's God say about that? What's the one thing that irritates you more than anything? Good. Turn to uh, James 1, 5. James 1, 5. Romans, turn right. Who was James again? There we go. James 1, 5. The brother that was a turncoat that talked smack about him the entire time he was on earth. And then, once he saw the resurrected Christ, there wasn't a more dedicated soldier. James 1 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and unabrideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that is wavering is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. 
For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Does, G, does James have the right to talk about double-mindedness? Yes. How many of us could really believe that our physical brother that's sitting beside us could also be God? We always like to bash Peter and some of these other guys and Thomas and James. But would you have believed it? They didn't have this. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have ability to take photographs. All they had were what here and now. They did not understand who he was. Did James get on the right ship after he figured out his brother was God? Yes. That's why he can say that. Now, since you're a citizen of heaven, since you have the same rights and privileges that Jesus did, and since faith is our currency, what he's saying is, if you ask and don't believe, you will not receive. Period. I don't care how many mantras you recite. I don't care. If you don't believe, if you have a doubt in your heart, you can't. Daily. I believe in but. I love you, but. I, I believe it, but. I, God said that, but. People tell me all the time, you got healed, I can't. What? What are you just stupid? Or deaf? Or both? I got healed, but you can't. But you believe so-and-so got a raise, so you deserve one. You believe you work as hard as that lady across the cubicle from you. She got a raise, you deserve one, but I got healed and you can't. Right? Christians tell me this. Well, that was, that was Old Testament. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you see how many people Jesus healed in New Testament? And he said, what I've done, you'll do better. Not worse. Jesus didn't go, yeah, I healed him, but you can't, Peter. <laughs> Peter, you're nothing. I got mad skills. See, Peter, you can't walk on water like I do. Anybody can make it about 30, 40 feet on water before he sinks? I'm high five. People forget there were high seas that day, and he made it from here to the camera before he sank, and then Jesus just grabbed his hand. And Jesus was out far enough to make it a challenge. Do you believe me or not? Jesus wasn't standing right beside him. Oh, I'm going down with one step. Now, after you go about 40 yards on the water, that's an accomplishment. But after I made it 40 yards, I believe I'd have probably kept going. But he did what? He looked at the waves. He looked at what was going on. So let's get this straight as I wind this lesson up. If you're going to make out a resolution for 2020, you have to realize who you are, what the game is, what you can accomplish, and do it through the Holy Spirit and through Christ. Was grace free? Yes. Does grace mean that we can have all the confidence of Jesus? Yes. We also have to receive it. What's that game we played as kids? We'd go over to somebody's house and they'd ask us if we wanted something when we were expected to say no. And they'd ask us five more times and finally we could say yes instead of just saying what we wanted to begin with. How stupid is that? I never put that rule on our kids. I mean, if somebody offers you something to drink, you're thirsty, get it. Stupid. If Jesus offers you his power every single day, 24-7, Who's stupid if they don't take it? All right, so in 2020, God has given you the ability to do exactly what he did. Okay, remember, the three years he did all of his miracles could not be recorded because there were so many. We got a couple, four guys that did, did books, and then we had more people that do books that weren't standing right beside him. Okay, Paul wasn't standing beside him, but Paul knew better than anyone what he accomplished. Oh, that's right, Paul's not a disciple, is he? How did Paul become part of Jesus' group? He received Christ. He changed citizenship. He understood he was a citizen of heaven. He received the power of the Holy Spirit, realizing he was the same as Christ. And then he went on to do more than Jesus did. Also, Paul took the deal at face value. Why aren't we? If he said you can do what he told you you could do every single day the rest of your life, why don't you take the deal? Or it's just like, uh, let's make a deal. There's three curtains, and you're going to pick one. But, see, that's how Lucifer does business. Lucifer's going to give you three options and then give you three bad ones and then destroy you. But Jesus is always going to give you the best one. You just have to say yes, and you have to receive it. Why is this so difficult? Now, David's right. I never went back to my notes. It's not even close to the sermon I was going to preach today. He's right. How many sermons have I actually preached by my notes? One. Even the creation, six days of creation, I threw the notes in the garbage and just did it by memory. But I teach quantum physics, so I better know that by memory. All right, so let's go over this as we close for the fifth time. If you're watching my home, David says to watch means nothing. It's, it's right, nothing. 
about a million thoughts a year. Now, are you going to control those million thoughts and get exactly what you want, or are you going to let Lucifer control those? Which one's it going to be? You've got to make a decision. People that come to me, I don't let them walk away not knowing. I'm brutally honest, and some people say I'm just mean. I'm mean because you won't make a decision. If you make a decision, I'm not mean. As a coach, I was brutal. But if you made a decision, what were the one thing as a coach I'd yell at you for? You could throw the ball away. I'm not going to yell about that. Effort. What's the one thing God's going to get on you for? Learn this word. This is the one thing that's going to get you in trouble with him. It's the very same thing that got you off my team as a player. Desire. I don't care who you were if we coached. We've coached all Americans with great talent that should have been stars, and we've coached kids that had no talent but effort. I'll keep the effort kid over the kid with talent. Because an effort kid's going to lace up every single day and give them everything you got. Talented kids sometimes don't. Ask NFL coaches. You got a lot of players that take plays off. Watch the NFL playoffs. You'll see guys kind of taking the playoff. J.J. Watt played with a, with a sort of peck in his body, surgically repaired, and played the whole game yesterday in enormous pain. Hockey players lose five teeth and wonder why they got taken out of the game. I played basketball with a fractured ankle. I had a kid beg me to put him back in and he was seeing triple one time. He actually had the audacity to get back on the floor. <laughs> Finally, the referee brought him back over because, Coach, I don't think you meant for him to be in the game. I didn't. Somebody sit on him. I got this, Coach. All right, where am I? He thought I was standing over here and I was standing in front of him. But he was going to play. See, God's looking for the desire to serve him. If you got desire, he's going to make sure you got everything you want coming. How do we reward our kids? We reward our kids if they got straight A's or whatever it is. If they're good, they clean the house, do the chores. Whatever it is, they get this. But if they don't, they get this. As an employer, as a client, as a father, I was very clear on this and this. Our kids had a chore list. I'm, I ran the, if you ever saw the movie The Great Santini, that's what it liked to have me as a dad. Everything runs on time. My classroom ran on time, my team ran on time, the kids at home run on time. You see all these stories of men not being able to control kids? I was the opposite. It was everything was done at a specific time, specific way I wanted it done. No questions asked. So if there was a consequence, they knew what it was, I normally didn't have to enact it. My classroom ran so well, if the kids showed up late, we didn't even speak about it. I'd just go. They'd come in and I'd go. We had a system. We don't even talk about what you did wrong. And by the time we got to here, they just take themselves down the hall, get their pass, come back. I never had to speak about it. Where does God want you? He just needs to hold a finger. All right, let's do this. So is everybody clear you have the exact same power Jesus did? My question is still, why aren't you using it? What are you going to do when you leave here today? Ah, it sounded great, but it's not for me. That sounded great, but he did it, but I can't. Do good things just happen to me, or do good things happen to a lot of people? Okay, I'm going to close today, but I'm, I'm going to tell a story about Jerry Savelle. Jerry Savelle is part of Kenneth Copeland's Southwest Believers Convention and was a heathen from hell just like I was. He liked to cuss, he liked to drink, he liked to chase women. And then he married a girl who was godly, and she straightened him out. Okay, the theme with Jesse, Jerry, and Kenneth, all three of their wives got their husbands saved, and all of them were on the highway to hell just like I was. Okay, so we have something in common. Jerry went to see his family over Christmas, and they drove from Texas to Oklahoma. And if you've ever driven the highway, was it I-35 or whatever? Boy, there's nothing out there, because we've driven it in the middle of the night. So you're coming back, and his car breaks down, because apparently his gas tank had gotten a hole in it, and he hit, a, he hit a, a bump in the road, and it punched a hole in his gas tank. He's out in the middle of nowhere, and if anybody's been out in that part of Texas, it is pitch black. All of a sudden he looks up and there's a guy with a wrecker coming down the road. Flags him down, he goes, uh, um, don't know what's wrong, you think you can help us? Well, I'm gonna have to tow you back to the station. He goes, well, I don't even know what's wrong. He goes, no, I was sent to help. Okay, so they go down, a few exits down, they pull off, there's this old gas station. The guy goes in, opens the door, and Jerry goes, uh, well, I don't know what's wrong, I don't know how much I can pay you. He goes, I was sent to help you. Guy goes in, repairs Jerry's car, shakes his hand, and says, enjoy your trip. 
Jerry comes back that way for a conference about two weeks later. He stops at the exit. He looks across the street at the, uh, at the gas station, and it's dilapidated. It's boarded up. There's nobody there. So he goes into the cafe, and he says, uh, I was here a couple weeks ago. Uh, where did the guy who owns the gas station go? He goes, sir, that gas station's been closed for 40 years. No, 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 I was here two weeks ago. Sir, that gas station hasn't been open. It's a wrong place. He goes, I know where I am. So he took the owner of the cafe outside. He goes, that gas station right there was open two weeks ago. I got my car fixed in the middle of the night. Don't argue with me. Well, now they think Jerry's nuts. So God tells Jerry, that was an angel I sent. He told you three times he was sent to help you. He fixed your car and he went on your way. No, that gas station has been closed for 40 years. When's the last time you had that type of situation? I can't tell you how many times angels have saved my life. Because these guys are real. You'll get to see that in the documentary about my life. There's a reason they made a documentary about my life, even though I vetoed it and thought it was stupid. Everybody else seems to think that my story's worth listening to, including the new girl. She thought it was too. So I bored Leanne with my family's stories and mine the other night, and she goes, that's pretty interesting. Okay, I lost. She wins. But how about your story? All right, Jerry has supernatural angel help all the time. We all started out with the same measure of faith. What's well, the one thing that irritates God? You not taking the deal. God's pretty good at the art of deal. Donald Trump's not the only one that wrote that book. I think God wrote it first. He's given you one deal. Receive Jesus, receive my grace, receive all the power, everything you ever asked for in my name through faith you can have. How simple is that? But we're going to have people every single day go, works for him, won't work for me. Okay, Jesus did it, but I can't. You can get healed, but I can't. What's the problem here? It's what between your ears. So here's your chance. Here's the day. Today, draw a line and sand. I'm going to take my 900,000 thoughts per month, and I'm going to control those because I want what God has for me. There's no sadder thought than when you get to heaven, and they're going to take you to a room, and they're going to show you everything that you did not get. And they're going to show you the bank account you had, faith, and they're going to show you everything that you didn't get because you didn't believe it was true. I, I fulfilled my organs. I called them all in. So I have all new organs. All right, so I got that done. All right, good. Got new body parts. I'm like the $25 million man. Good check. All right, what else do I want? He said, I'll give you desires of your heart if you'll believe in me. Every single time Jesus heals somebody, what did he ask them first? Lady of issue of blood in Mark 5, what did she say repeatedly? If I touch his garment, I'll be healed. What did he tell Jairus? His daughter was already dead. What did he tell him? Shh. You've already said that I could heal your daughter. Keep your mouth shut. Don't say another word because when I get there, I'm going to resurrect her. He asked repeatedly, what do you want? Can I do it? If you say I can do it, you can receive it. Why is it I can walk? Billy Burke pulls somebody out of a wheelchair at Southwest Believers Convention, Miracles on the Mountain, and then you can't get up and heal a paper cut. Or God can't pay your mortgage. Or you can't get a new job. Or you can't fix your marriage. Whatever it is. Why are you putting limitations on God? Because look, your citizenship's in heaven. There aren't any limitations in heaven. And you got the same power as Jesus. Did Jesus do support groups where he said, All right, tell me how you feel. All right, yeah, you're right. I can't do anything about that. I stopped doing support groups. And I used to do a lot here in Atlanta. Because I got tired of listening to people whine. What's God going to tell you? Shut up. Stop whining. Start professing what I told you you could have. Now, next week, we get back to the playbook. If you're just joining us, my job as a coach is to teach you how to win. As a coach, a real coach in basketball, we had a playbook about this stick. You have to put the plays in systematically throughout the whole year. You can't teach everything at one time or they won't know anything. So I have to start with the fundamentals, which we're learning as a church, the fundamentals of faith. And then I put in the plays on how to beat Lucifer. Now, the great thing is, who's our opponent every single day? The great thing is we only have one opponent. So if we watch film on him once, we know exactly what he does, right? We don't have to continuously watch what he does. Now, if you want to watch what Lucifer does, just watch the nightly news. He controls it. So if you want to watch your enemy, watch that. I haven't seen the news in so many years. People tell me something about a current event I don't even know what they're talking about. I don't watch TV. I watch Roku. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. This past week, we watched all reruns from Johnny Carson from 1974. And then we watched all of Don Rickles, one of my favorite comedians, because I want to laugh. At no time, I, I, I don't even know what Channel Fox News is. 
That's part of Satan's regime anyway. Hey, newsflash, Fox News is not conservative. It's about making money. It's about making money. Lucifer wants to control your thoughts. Who's in control of the airways? Lucifer. Remember that when you turn the TV on. So now make a decision. If you're at home, if you've never accepted Jesus, here's a good time. Receive him as Lord and Savior. But don't stop there. Hmm, there's more. It's like an infomercial. Once you get your citizenship in heaven, you need the power here. Now you have to receive the Holy Spirit. If you want to know why that is true, read all of Acts, specifically Acts 2, and then go through 6, 9, 7, 8, 19. I'll let you go there. And 16. Read those chapters. What you'll encounter is Peter encountered believers that had received Christ but had not received the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not have same, same as Jesus. If you look back at the original Gospels, all four, when he got baptized, the Holy Spirit also came on him. That's how he got his power. That's how you get your power. That's how I got healed. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do anything. Without the Holy Spirit, I can do nothing. Okay, remember, can you see him? No. Do you know he's there? Okay, can you fight something that's invisible by yourself? Because you can't see him, right? You can only see him one dimension at a time. Jesus can see nine. He operates in all nine, so does Jesus. So if he operates in nine dimensions of time and you operate in one, who's going to beat you every single time? Okay, just from a quantum level, you have no shot at this. But as soon as the Holy Spirit's on, now you have the ability to beat him in all nine. Without the Holy Spirit, he beats you every single time. With the Holy Spirit, he can never defeat you. Is this math too hard for you? Okay, good. At least we got that going for us. All right, everybody stand up and we'll dismiss in prayer. Remember, we're going to do communion after the service today, not on camera. But next time we'll do it with you. All right? So if you're at home, go ahead and stand up. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And we'll dismiss in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to have the Holy Spirit, to have the power, to have identity in Christ, to have citizenship in heaven, not be time, bound by time and space, and have the exact same power that Jesus had. Now, Lord, help us understand what we have, what our citizenship is, and how we can use that power to proclaim the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out devils. That is our job in Mark 16, 15, and on through the end of Mark 16. Lord, thank you so much for giving us Bibles. The disciples didn't have them. We're glorified that we have these Bibles. You gave us a playbook. All we have to do is read it every single day, digest it, receive it, and go do it. That's it. It's very simple to be a Christian. Now, thank you so much for empowering us for 2020. Thank you for giving us the ability to choose what you want us to do this year. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Remember, if you want to get in touch with us, if you want to be part of our giving, or if you want prayer requests, our prayers work. Go to EncounterChrist.org, drop us a line, let us know what you need, and we'll be there for you. Until next week, next week we start back with the playbook, and I'll get right back on how to defeat Lucifer, because that's our entire goal for 2020. Until then, see you. Who's seen the, the videos of people that have been to hell? I went through the exact same thing. You can feel the heat. You can feel your skin burning. It bubbles up. It's horrific. I hated Christians. I hated Christians so much that I wanted to burn down every single church that I ever went by. And uh, I didn't like Christians. I didn't understand why they would worship a pseudo God. Jesus was as real to me as the Easter Bunny. So what was the point of worshiping an entity that was not real? And um, I was a pretty staunch atheist, so to speak, uh, and very proud of it. He told me um, a few years ago when we were catching up that um, sometimes when he'd come to my house, um, you know, my mom and dad would always insist that he eat dinner with us or whatever, you know, when he came over. Uh, and he would, you know, he said, you know, sometimes that was the only meal he had that day. I remember as a teenager, I, I slept with a gun underneath my pillow. Things had gotten so bad at home. And it's like he was using drugs and alcohol and, you know, just whatever he wanted to do. And then until he was saying that he hit complete rock bottom and was ready to take his own life. It surprised me that Scott Beam, a pastor, because um, let's say there were 100 people in the room that I knew. Um, how many would become pastors? Not Scott. <laughs> Is your personal story tangible enough for people to go, I'm going to give up that to go with you? Was Jesus' life tangible enough for Peter and all the merry men to get up and go, I'm going with you? I, I just can't tell you the anger that comes over me because this is the person who has followed Christ at a great personal cost. To receive Christ 
it just, it was overwhelming um, to feel, uh, David ruined my life when he introduced me to Jesus. I had to give up women, drugs, and alcohol. I thought I had it going on. What people didn't realize was I'd already made out my suicide note that week. And that was the last time I had planned on seeing him. For the first time in my life, I felt love. 